Hello, this is Dr. Joanne Manson, Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. I'd like to talk with you about a recent report in Annals of Internal Medicine on vitamin D and type 2 diabetes. I think this report provides some new insights, but also raises several new questions. This was a meta-analysis and individual participant meta-analysis of three randomized trials of people with prediabetes. One was the D2D trial that tested 4,000 I use a day of vitamin D3. Another was the Tromso trial from Norway, which tested bolus dosing of vitamin D3, 20,000 I use weekly, or about 3,000 I use daily. And third was a, um, synthetic, a trial from Japan that tested a synthetic analog of, of vitamin D. Um, so this was calcitriol. And these three trials in aggregate had an average of about three years duration. And the hazard ratio um, in the meta-analysis was 0.88, or modest risk reduction that just met statistical significance for the intention to treat unadjusted analysis. And after adjustment for other diabetes risk factors, it was 0.85 with a confidence interval 0.75 to 0.96. Now, the trials really weren't large enough or long enough to do a rigorous assessment of safety, but they didn't see clear safety uh, signals uh, looking at hypercalcemia and uh, kidney stones. They did see a little bit of edging up toward about a doubling in, in risk of hypercalcemia, but was not uh, statistically significant. Now, interestingly, they did see effect modification by body mass index, as has been seen in many other vitamin D trials. We've seen this in our vital trial that BMI modified the effect of vitamin D for total invasive cancer, cancer death, autoimmune diseases, and some other outcomes. They saw that among those who had a BMI um, at the median of, uh, below the median of 31, there was a significant 24% reduction in risk, but those who had a BMI at the median or above 31 or above had no reduction whatsoever in diabetes risk. Their, their hazard ratio was 1.01. Now, interestingly, the synthetic analog, um, the results for that were similar hazard ratio, but there was no modifying effect of uh, body mass index. And the authors postulate that this is because the um, vitamin D3, the cholecalciferol, requires conversion to the 25-hydroxy vitamin D in the liver and other tissues, and that um, the CYP2R1 is affected by body mass index, some evidence that weight loss can upregulate uh, the CYP2R1 expression. And so the high body mass index may actually interfere with um, the ability to convert to the biologically active form of vitamin D. Now, these doses of vitamin D are on the high side, and in fact, they're um, quite similar. Uh, to the tolerable upper intake level set by the Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Medicine, five to six times. Uh, the recommended dietary allowance that's been set for general population uh, guidelines. So um, clearly, we need more research on um, in terms of safety uh, long-term use of vitamin D at these higher doses. But I think it's important to compare these results with that of the diabetes prevention program uh, trial where people with prediabetes were also tested. Lifestyle modifications resulted in a 58% reduction in T2D. And, um, and also metformin resulted in about 31% reduction, so much larger reductions than seen with um, the high-dose vitamin D. We also need comparisons with moderate-dose vitamin D in people with prediabetes to see if really these, these high doses are, are needed and if more is better uh, for this purpose. But I think um, it's important still to be focusing primarily on lifestyle modifications for prevention of type 2 diabetes and additional research on vitamin D, um, particularly the safety of these higher doses, will be very important. Thank you so much for your attention. This is Joanne Manson.